Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this morning is our gospel lesson from Luke 18 that we read just a few minutes ago. Before the sermon, I'll reread the last two and a half verses of our text. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice, and quickly. So far, our text. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has torn the temple veil in two, that we may approach our Heavenly Father, dear Christian friends. No is a complete sentence. It requires no added explanation. It stands all by itself because it is, in and of itself, a complete thought. Now, it is, of course, predicated on whatever went before. If someone stated something that they assumed was a fact, no tells them it was not actually a fact that they stated. If someone made a request of you, no denies that request. Nothing needs to be added to no to make it clearly understood. Now, of course, sometimes we may want to add something to no to soften it a little bit because it can come across as just a little bit harsh all by itself. No. But no is a complete thought. No is something that a parent learns very quickly to tell his or her children. No. And it's a good thing to tell children. My favorite child psychologist says, every day, give your kids a healthy dose of vitamin N. The N being no. Tell them no. It's good for them. It is good for them to know that they can't have everything they want whenever they want it. Tell them no. It will serve them well later in life. No means no. That was actually a song that we taught our kids growing up. No means no. No is always no. If you say no, it means a thousand times no. No. No doesn't always mean no, though. Now, no means no. That became a political slogan a few years ago as some groups wanted to uh, highlight the fact that sometimes women were not receiving justice when they felt threatened or even assaulted by men. And so the slogan was, no means no. If a woman says no, the man has to stop right there and then. No means no. And, And that's safe for us to assume, too, that whatever the context is, when we hear no, no means no. Yet we all know from experience there are certain times when no might not mean no. Certain times. Not many times, but certain times. For example, you're buying a new car, you want to negotiate the best price, you make an offer to the salesperson, the salesperson says no, that may or may not mean no. You may just have to press it a little bit more. They may just be hoping you increase your offer. And the same is true on the opposite side of the table. When they give you a counteroffer, you can say no and pretend to get up from the table. Maybe you don't really mean no. You're just hoping that maybe they'll come down a little bit more. No doesn't necessarily mean no. And unfortunately, we as parents also know that no matter how much we mean our no's, when we say no to our children, sometimes those no's can eventually turn into yeses. Even though we have every intent when we say no to stick to it, If they keep on getting after us, if they keep on asking for the same thing over and over, every parent's been there, sometimes you reevaluate and you say, should I just say yes to get them off my back, to quiet them up? And so you say yes when you meant to say no all along. So sometimes kids get the lesson, no doesn't necessarily mean no. In our parable for this morning that serves as our sermon text, the parable of the persistent widow and the unjust judge. Jesus reminds us that no doesn't always mean no. And I dare say that if Jesus were telling a parable to us today to explain the truth that God's no is not always no, he very well may may have used the example of a parent being influenced by his his or her child to change a no into yes, because that's kind of what happens here. When no doesn't always mean no, how does that affect our prayer life? In the parable of the unjust judge and the persistent widow, there is a widow who as such has practically no legal rights in that day and age. 
and she has an adversary. The adversarial relationship isn't spelled out for us in our text, but we can make an educated guess as to what's happening. Her property is being threatened. Someone is trying to take over, by a show of right, that which should belong to her. And because she has no one who's going to stand up for her, she has to go to the person who has been elevated as a judge in the place that she lives. The only problem with that is the judge. We are given an, in, an insight into the judge's heart and mind, and he does not fear God and does not care about people. Perhaps he's been paid off by the adversary. He is not going to give her justice. He's not going to hear her case. He says no. But she can't leave it at that because she needs that no to not be a no. So she keeps going back again and again. Finally, the no becomes yes. And once again, we're granted an insight into what the judge is thinking. It isn't that he had a change of heart and suddenly developed warm feelings towards this widow or a thought of care and concern for this widow. No, the only thing that changed was that he got so bothered by her that he wanted to get her off his back. What shall I do? She's going to wear me out with her coming, he says in our text. So the no becomes a yes. Now, every analogy limps, even our Savior's analogies limp, and it's very easy to see the point at which this analogy limps because in the parable, the unjust judge stands for our Heavenly Father. And our Heavenly Father is not unjust. And our Heavenly Father is loving and caring towards us. But even in that point of difference, Jesus highlights the lesson that he's teaching. He says, think of the unjust judge. Listen to what the unjust judge says. His no didn't actually stay a no. He meant it to be a no, but no did not mean no here because it was able to be changed. And Jesus says, if that's true of people on earth, if unjust judges can be swayed to change their mind just because they don't want to be bothered anymore, or taking our example from earlier, if parents can turn their, yeses, their no's into yeses just because their children whine long enough, how much more should we be certain that our Heavenly Father, who loves us and has almighty power to give us whatever He knows we need, will in fact use that power to give us what we need when we need it and we can keep on asking for whatever it is we need until we actually get it. Or until God shows us that's absolutely not the way he was thinking and he has something else in mind. We can keep on asking. I think too often our prayers are just sort of one-shot deals where we think of something that we need or something occurs to us that we need and we pray to God and we ask God for that particular thing, which is a good thing to do. Certainly God tells us to do that. But then, whether it happens or not, that, that's the end of it. We move on from there. Jesus spells out very clearly why he's teaching this parable in the first verse of our text. So that his disciples will keep on praying and not give up. <coughs> Say we get a yes answer to our prayer. That's still cause to pray to God again. Pray to God again to thank him. And if no is the answer to your prayer, if you don't get what you've been praying for, God says pray again. And if you don't get it the second time, pray again. Yes, no does benefit children, and we can trust that, that God as our Heavenly Father sometimes uses no as a benefit to us as his children, that, that perhaps we learn patience, that perhaps we learn to examine our lives and, and what we are praying for according to his will. Yes. There are all sorts of things that parents can do in raising children that, that will benefit them later on in life. One of the single most important things that parents can do is to spend time with their children, right? Right? So think of a father playing with his son, playing cards with his son, playing a board game with his son, 
going out to the basketball hoop and playing a game of horse with his son. And now think of that son 30 years later, looking back at the time he spent with his dad. Do you think the son is concerned about who won the game of horse, who won the game of cards 30 years out? Of course not. He's thinking, my father was willing to spend time with me. That's really the ultimate lesson of our text. We have a father who wants to spend time with us. He spends time with us in coming to us in his word and invites us to spend time with him in prayer. And the time that we spend with him is actually more important than whatever it is we're asking for. Now, I'm not trying to run down what it is we pray for. God certainly invites us to bring every care and concern that we have to him in prayer, and he promises that he hears us, and he promises that our concerns are important to him as well. Think of it. Whatever it is we're praying for, whether we're praying for uh, God to resolve a health crisis that we're going through, whether we're praying for God to bless a friend or a family member, whether we're praying to God for some material blessing, whatever we are praying for is truly less important than the fact that God wants to be with us. Because whatever blessing he bestows on us here on earth, in the way of physical health, material blessing, it all ends up not meaning a whole lot when we get to heaven. But what we will have in heaven, what the essence of heaven is, is being in the presence of God forever. And we know that even now, we have a loving God who wants to be with us invites us to come to him in prayer. I dare say that when we are in heaven, thinking back on our prayers that we've offered here on earth, we won't be as concerned with whether or not our Heavenly Father gave us what we asked for or didn't give us what we asked for. What we will be rejoicing for for all of eternity is that our Heavenly Father wanted to spend time with us. That's the greatest blessing of going to God in prayer. Not what we're asking for, but the fact that we have a Father, a loving Father, who wants to be with us, who actually, through His Son Jesus, made it possible for us to be with Him forever, who continually comes to us with His gifts of forgiveness and joy and peace, who takes care of everything that we need in our earthly lives, so that we never forget that he has already taken care of our heavenly future. So think of that next time you're praying for something. Praying for something that you're absolutely sure that you need. Sure that you ought to have from God. Some blessing from God. Some gift from him. Some intervention by him. He may not exactly agree with the conclusion that you've come to but he still invites you to pray to him. And if he says no once, pray to him again. If he says no twice, pray to him again. And rejoice. Not necessarily because that which you are praying for is being granted to you in the way that you are asking for it, but because your heavenly Father is spending time with you, his dear child. That's what your Father wants, to be with you to spend time with you, and for you to want to spend time with him. That's what our Savior Jesus did when he was on the earth. He made time to be alone with his heavenly Father, sometimes going up by himself on a mountainside to pray. The lesson for us is obvious. Pray to God for everything that you need, everything that you want. And if God says yes, keep on praying. Pray, pray for more. Pray th prayers of thanks. If God says no, pray to him again. Ask him for the exact same thing. Keep on praying. Like Jacob in our first lesson, wrestle with God in prayer. But realize, too, that the greatest blessing you receive from God through prayer is not necessarily the request, the granting of a request that you're making him, but the fact that your God wants to come down and spend time with you. Your God spends time with you now. Sometimes his no is an invitation to spend more time with him. 
and also an opportunity to look forward to the glories of heaven, where God will be saying yes to you forever. Amen. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.